application security options, a smart things case study. Uh, if you want the slides, they should be up already at that bit.ly link. Uh, the link will be up throughout the slide deck if I didn't screw up the CSS, which I was not editing right before you all walked in. <laughs> uh, turns out, uh, Application of Security Options is not the best name for the talk. A, better, a slightly better name will be Authorization and Authentication Options. So we're going to focus on your running app, how to authenticate with your users in between services, things like that. If that's not what you signed up for, I misled you, I'm sorry. F feel free to catch the other talks. I will not be offended. If uh, I want to show you what we're going to go over, if this is hopefully something you're interested in, please stay. But if it's not exactly right, find the part of the conference that's great for you. Uh, we're just going to do a quick intro. I'll tell you a little bit about what SmartThings is so you get a sense of what like we deal with, because this is all about our learnings as well. Uh, we'll do just really quick terminology. Uh, we'll talk about OAuth 2, the JWT family, uh, HTTP signatures, and then how we use those technologies at SmartThings in particular. And then at the end, we're going to go through some of the tips and tricks uh, of scaling auth, because things work at 1,000 users and then stop working at a million. And then you go to 10 million, and a different set breaks. And when you keep going past that, what are those like things that start getting hard <laughs> that shouldn't be hard? And at any time, if you have questions, shout at me. I will answer them. So I'm Jeff if that wasn't clear already. Uh, I work at SmartThings. I do software there. So what is SmartThings? SmartThings is a platform for IoT. We connect and automate all your devices. So that means we have a lot of devices constantly talking to our platform. And because of that, we have some unique scale issues that when we talk about like number of things that we're trying to authenticate, when you have a user that may have hundreds of devices in their house, that becomes a unique problem. So we get to see the scale problems a little bit earlier than other people. Uh, we have multiple mobile clients. And we have uh, many connected devices and an open API to allow anyone to connect to us. The platform itself has more than 150 microservices in production right now. It is a mix of Java, Groovy, Kotlin, Scala, Rust, JavaScript, and Swift that I could think of easily that had at least more than one service running in it. Uh, we have a number of JVM frameworks. I'm more of a JVM developer, so I can't tell you what the frameworks we use in the other languages are. But that gives you an idea of the expanse that we're trying to deal with. And when it comes to authentication and authorization, so, some trickiness comes in because you can't just use a single library everywhere that would kind of abstract some of this. Terms. These, these are the three that I think are a little confusing at times, but kind of basic to everything. So uh, the principal is the entity acting with the credential when we talk about it. So that's the thing acting. So if you're authenticating with a mobile phone, you, the user, would be the principal. But if you have an automation or something like that authenticating, that's where that other thing is the principal. Uh, it'll make more sense as we go through that, but having a sense of what a principal is should help. And then authentication, sometimes abbreviated auth n, is proving something is the requested principal. So that says I am who I say I am, whereas authorization uh, is granting what the principal can do. So what is that person who is what they say there is, what can they do? So those are the kind of dimensions. OAuth 2. So this is our first major like technology we use at SmartThings. Uh, we, we has two major use cases. Uh, either your application has its own authorization server, or your app application is integrating with some third party. So that would be the case of using something like uh, Google SSO or something like that would be that kind of third party. So if, it, if it's with an authorization server, uh, a lot of times I like to talk about this as OAuth in because things are coming into you. It, it, there's not great terms for this, so I'm, that's why I put it in quotes. <laughs> uh, 
the mobile app's going to call your resource server, you're going to do your check tokens, and all of this is kind of housed within your, your application. So when you're doing an external immigration, a lot of times what's happening, let's say we're going to call out to GitHub to get a list of PRs. What we'd end up doing is when you link these accounts together, it's going to do this OAuth2 kind of handoff where it redirects you from their website back to ours and back and forth. But the key is generally when you have a single client in this case. So it's your application has a single OAuth client from GitHub. And all of your users end up funneling through that client. Whereas with, when you have your own authorization server, you're the one that tends to be granting the OAuth clients. So you are telling the mobile app, your partners, or whoever is integrating with you, like, here's your OAuth client, here's how to connect to us. So I've now said client and a few things that might not have been clear. So let's go kind of what are all the parts of an authorization in the OAuth world. Now there's, a, there's more to it than this. this is, these are the ones that in our work at SmartThings have become the most useful and the most confusing at times uh, to people when they first approach the platform. So that's why we're going to go over them. we have the OAuth client. This is the application that's doing the call to start authenticating. These are the ones that are, like in our case, it's our mobile app or a third-party integration to our APIs. Uh, the parts of a client ID. You're going to have a client ID, a client secret for sure, and the client ID and client secret tend to just be UUIDs. Any identifier really works. Uh, the secret is, as it says, something that's supposed to be secret. Client IDs are not intended to be treated as secret. When you do some of these integrations, sometimes you'll notice that people treat them as secret. They really shouldn't. It shouldn't matter. But if you want to treat it as secret, good for you. Be more careful. Uh, there's a set of grants and a set of scopes as well. You'll notice that I'm saying a set of grants and a set of scopes. Uh, we'll define what grants and scopes are, but that means it is an un unordered list. Uh, it's important to understand that it's not just one and it's not ordered. Now we have a whole bunch of optional parts of a client. So a client uh, in many implementations has a name. I would highly suggest you always add a name because remembering whose UUID just showed up doing something silly against your API is really hard and having a human readable name. It, it sounds easy, but when you go from having 100 OAuth clients to 1,000 and beyond, it comes really handy. Uh, the next uh, is token expiration. So this is an optional thing that allows you to configure how long an authorization token will actually be valid for as part of OAuth. And that's where this is something that's optional. You don't have to have that per client. And it's probably not something you would want your partners that are your third parties integrating with you to actually be able to set. Uh, we, we can set it per client based on uh, how, how sensitive the APIs they're interacting with are. So like if we know they're only reading the status of your lights in your house and they're not turning off your alarm system, we will give them potentially a longer grant period than the people that want to control your alarm system. So we can ba we have to think about balancing like those security risks and being able to set it per client is a nice way to do that. Uh, refresh expiration is the same thing but for refresh tokens and this is basically how long is okay for this token to not be active before so you can like if you have a refresh token that lasts let's say two weeks the the partner will have to call your service at least every two weeks to get a new refresh token to like re-up their authorization. So if you have something like a mobile device that a lot of times if you leave your mobile device uh, logged into your, like your bank account, put it in a drawer, three months later you pull your phone out, you're all logged out everywhere. That's because your phone's been off, it hasn't done that refresh. And that's where what is the appropriate one depends on what device this is going on. The redirect URI is used as part of the authorization code flow grant. And that's 
what URLs are valid for this client. And URLs is interesting. Oh, sorry, it's actually URI because uh, Android can do, and iOS can do intents with a URI. So you can actually have it redirect into an app uh, on, if you're on a mobile device. And you're validating what is OK as part of this auth code grant to go through. I've now said grant enough that someone wonders what a grant is, I hope. Uh, an OAuth grant is describing really how you're going to get the authorization materials. So there is a whole bunch of grants available. I'm only going to talk about the ones we use at SmartThings. There are some others that are out there that are very valid. They're great. These are the ones I know and I can speak to and answer questions to. Uh, if you're the only one that I would call out that's not in the slides is the password grant, which I password grants are a very interesting proposition. Be very careful of them because they are something where you're asking the third party client to get your user's username and password and then pass it to you. So that, that gets really uh, dangerous in they can then they don't have to necessarily protect that password because they entered it into their system, then passed it on to you, and you validated it. So it gets to be a really weird relationship. It's not something you typically do, and if you need to do it, understand why, and make sure you trust that third party really well. So the auth code grant is something you've all probably seen and not realized it. Uh, when you authorize something at GitHub or in Google, and it you basically, it redirects you, you see the little page, and you sign in, it says authorize or deny. You hit authorize and it redirects you back. What actually happens is it's posting back an auth code and the server on the other side takes that auth code, sends it back and exchanges it for another. So this allows you to have your users grant authorization to third parties without ever passing the, their password to that third party. And it allows you to limit based on the the scopes, what they can actually do. Uh, like I, said, I have links to the overview and spec, which we won't go over, but the slides will have them all. Uh, in OAuth, you're going to have to jump back to the spec quite often <laughs> because everyone tries to implement the spec. It's pretty detailed. It's pretty approachable. So that's why I do have the spec details in all the links. But the overview is a nice starting spot. Client credentials. This is basically just the password grant, but for your OAuth client. So this actually does tend to get used for things that are system to system or uh, internal to your application, where your application itself is getting like a single token to just make sure you know who is calling within your microservices. That's when we, where we tend to use this. This is sometimes used more broadly. It just all kind of depends what's best for you. Implicit grants. These are basically what they say. Uh, authorization and authentication has happened somewhere else in the flow. And all you're doing is basically sending in for a given client, give me an OAuth token because I've already authorized externally to the OAuth flow. This happens in particular for scheduled jobs for us. So the system knows that in the past, this user has authorized this action, and then we can do an implicit grant internally to the system so the calls are still authenticated normally. Instead of going through a completely spe special path, they just get a piece of auth credential specially. Refresh. Refresh is not something you ever use to start. Uh, refresh token is a way to extend the life of your existing grants. So a lot of times an OAuth client will have both access code and refresh token grants available on it, and that allows you, you do the auth code first, you're going to get back an access token and a refresh token. You can then use the refresh grant with a refresh token in order to get new access tokens that have new life, basically. So this is what you do to keep like renewing and saying, yep, this user is still active, it's still happening. Device OAuth. I, I, this is probably my favorite grant because I'm weird and I have a favorite grant. Uh, <laughs> uh, this is one where if you've uh, authenticated to a TV like with Netflix and a lot of those where it pops up a big code and it says type in so-and-so to activate, uh, that's actually the device OAuth spec. 
which is a draft spec right now, but it's really interesting. It's great if you have a big screen and really poor input. Uh, it, then there's a whole, in the spec, there's a whole like handshake and polling mechanism that's in place that allows you to do it. So scopes, what can a client actually do? So once you have the principle, you know who it is, you have your actual tokens that you got through your grant process, the scopes, which is part of the client, tells you what scopes are allowed, and this is what the user is actually allowed to do. You always want to kind of limit to the principle of least privilege. Uh, it's easy to say, hard in practice. <laughs> Let's go through a GitHub example, because this one's, I think, really easy and approachable. So they have, uh, they have a whole bunch of scopes, but here are four example scopes. You'll notice that they have u both user, read user, and user email. And so the idea there is if you only need to read the user's email, you can ask for just the internal scope, but if you ask for the higher level scope, you get access to everything. And so that means if I'm building an integration, I won't have the ability to delete your repo if I'm just building something that comments on your pull requests, because that's a separate scope. So delete repo is a scope that only lets you delete repos. And then if you wanted that access, the user would be, would be told, oh yeah, they're gonna be able to delete your repo, which would be weird if all I was doing is building an app that listed your pull requests. So you would know not to authorize that. So what we did in SmartThings scopes, and this is where the kind of like our details come out is in smart things you have devices and locations and what you can do with a device matters like it matters whether or not it's a light bulb versus a lock and so we wanted to make sure we had a really powerful way of dealing with that access so we came up with you'll notice that in GitHub, you have this like user and user read only, and you have this like hierarchy being built out. That's been coming much later in GitHub. What we did is since we were starting later, we built a system of defining scopes that was somewhat programmatic. And it looks like this. So the idea is we want to make sure that reading, writing, or executing commands are all separate things that depending on what you're doing with the device, things should either have access to or not. So if I'm building a dashboard that goes on a TV that's not taking user entry at all, it should only ever have read access to things. And so it can ask for that. So we broke down it like this. I know this is a little hard to approach, so let's go through a little scenario. We have a location in SmartThings. It's a house. It has two devices a smart lock, and a temperature sensor. Okay, simple building. If I give someone the scope, our device is one, two, three, and our device is five, 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 it's very simple. They can read the state of both of the devices, the smart lock and the thermostat, and, but they can't execute commands, and they can't change the name of the devices. But if we do something like our device's star, and X device is one, two, three, we've defined star as saying access to everything that entity is installed into. So in this case, this is like a user's principle, so they're able to get access to all the devices the user has. And that's fine for reading, and they're able to execute commands for one, two, three, but they can't do anything with executing commands on 555 or device details like changing the name. Now, What's really important is in your applications, when you, if you have lots of things you want to permission, depending on the client, starting with some programmatic hierarchical scopes is really good. It's really hard to retrofit later without revving your API. So if you can start at the beginning or with a new version, it's, it's really easy to make these kind of extensible scoping. So we've defined it such that if we want to do more details, we keep adding on de colons deeper. So you can actually get access to like subcomponents of a device instead of the entire device and things like that. And that just keeps working in our system because we kind of le read left from right. 
tokens themselves. Now, there are two main types of tokens in the OAuth, access and refresh. Access tokens are intended to be short-lived. They won't always be, depending on the implementation, but they should be. Uh, they're just used to access the APIs themselves. They are sent lots of times, so that's why they're intended to be shorter, because the likelihood of them being compromised should be higher. Refresh tokens should be stored securely, because the, and because they are the thing that lets you get new access, and they allow you to get new access tokens, but they're sent very infrequently. So if it's every 20 days, every 30 days, whatever it is, but they live a long time. Any questions about OAuth before we go on to JWT? Yes, because uh, in our system, we're able to short circuit uh, because the reads are actually gits. So if you're in a git method, we can actually short circuit. Like, uh, <laughs> basically, in order to do this at scale, we wanted to be able to short circuit that evaluation as soon as possible. So we could say immediately, you're down a write path, and you have no execute or write permissions. We're out. <laughs> so yeah. The JWT family. Uh, you've probably heard of these. I said family because they're kind of all mushed together. Uh, JWS, JWT, and JWE. They all get uh, used back and forth. Uh, they're all useful. Uh, we personally at SmartThings only use JWT. Uh, we don't use JWE. Uh, JWS is a way of signing. Uh, it allows us to basically trust what's being exchanged and it hasn't been tampered with. Uh, in particular, it enables JWT. So JWS is like a building block that you're going to see and some of the libraries that you implement, will, will, you'll see it mentioned, so you should know what it is. JWT is an open way of like basically building things off JWS. It's really powerful. In particular, it's great uh, for using an, it as an encoded access token. So if you have a self-encoded access token, you don't need to go do a database lookup. So you can reduce the data store calls for credentials. So if you want, if you d download the slides, you can copy this. It's actually a JWT. It looks weird. Here's what's actually in it, in the JSON. That's just base64 encoded. Every dot uh, delimitates one of the three sections. So this is what's actually in there. If you want to try it, try that. Uh, JWT.io, there's a debugger on there, lets you paste in your JWT, it's really great to, and there's the signature to verify. So in particular, uh, payload is in plain text. So, and you don't put things that are sensitive in your JWT. Uh, you can use JWT to address that. Next, JWTs are effectively hard to revoke. So if you need to remove access for a JWT, the only way to do that is to have something that's looking up the details about the JWT. The thing that's nice about JWT is there's, there's public key signatures, so you don't want to call out to check whether or not it's revoked because now you're back to like a standard opaque token. So you, what we like to do then is make sure you go with short JWTs that have opaque like refresh tokens so you can kind of pair the pieces together. If you really want to hide what's in your JWT, that's what JWE is for. It has more dots. In particular, oops, it's going to have a lot more information in the header that tells the program interpreting this basically how to decrypt the body. If you'd like to kind of play with it a little bit, there's this example project that I, that I think is really nice. It's in Node, unfortunately, but it's really nice anyway. Uh, so you can go in there, it'll generate JWTs and uh, JWEs for you, and you can kind of play with it, and it basically sends them back and forth to itself. So it works in a tight loop, you don't have to install a lot of things. All right, HTTP signatures. Oh, sorry. Questions about JWTs before I go on. Okay. 
So HTTP signatures is a really nice emerging like system that isn't heavily used yet. So where have you seen it potentially? If you've used the AWS API, it's using JWT signature. Sorry, it's using HTTP signatures, but not exactly. Uh, they predated the spec, so they're kind of using a custom way of doing it, but the signed requests are effectively the same. Slack calls, once again, same methodology, but custom implementation. Joint actually does have the real implementation that's part of the implementation uh, like of the spec. So that's really interesting if you've used Joint. The idea is you're going to create a digest of the parts of the request that matter. You're then going to sign it. And there's going to be a set of public keys at a known URL that people can then validate against. So it allows you to sign the request flowing out of your system very easily so that third parties can go validate them without you having to expect them to set up an auth system for you. So in particular, you're going to send a bunch of signed requests to your external app. And the get public keys call is only going to happen once. And you can then highly cache that. In particular, there's a sequence diagram if you want to see like what's actually happening is the sign key from like this notification server on my end flows out to the external app. You're going to validate the request. Notice that you don't have the key ID. So the key ID is now a header that it tells you what key you need to use. You would then go get the keys from a known URL. Now that's interesting because you have to like the first implementation, the thought was, why don't we put the URL of the key in the request? And then the question is, well, how do people know what URLs are valid? Uh, because the whole point is to say, you trust us, so here's the known URL. So we decided to say, here's the known URL that you can get all of our keys. Uh, we put that as a list, and then you have a list of keys in there. You can then cache those, and every subsequent call right here, you can just immediately validate the request and return a 200. You don't have to like keep going out and getting those keys over and over again. So it makes it very performant for us because we don't have to deal with all of those callbacks to validate the thing we sent them. HTTP signatures in general are really nice, but only sign the parts of the request that don't get changed. So we use a lot of microservices. As a request sometimes flows across those microservices or load balancers, you might get rate limit headers and things like that added on by other services. So anywhere that that's happening, you have to make sure that that's not part of your digest because that would make the signature actually invalid. And that sounds easy to do, but it's also very easy to forget because if rate limit was something that your service was doing and then you've decided that there's a new central service that will do rate limiting for you and applies some headers letting people know their new rate limits, that suddenly starts invalidating every request that flows out of the system. You also want to make sure you expose a set of public keys because the, if you don't expose a set, if it's a single key, you can't do a zero downtime roll of your keys. So you want to always tell everyone that here is the set of keys that are valid for me, and so one of them will be the key that's currently valid. And then you want to have the next key you're going to use. And then there's a window as you do your deployment that's switching keys potentially over uh, your private keys. If you're going to roll your private key, that, that roll has to happen such that the things that are in flight are still valid. Then the new key, it should also be valid at the same time. So just by having a set in your API docs and everywhere else and having everyone implement to a set first, allows you to do private key rolling, which everyone says, oh, I'll never roll my private key. And then someone commits something to GitHub, and it gets leaked, and you have to roll all your private keys. So uh, it's like what we found is the first thing we did was when we deployed to staging, uh, had everyone test, we actually immediately rolled the keys about a week in uh, just to make sure we could. And we didn't do it right. We horribly failed at it. 
Uh, and we basically had a minute of bad requests, which for us is a huge amount of problem. <laughs> uh, we're not okay with having a minute of invalid requests going out of the system. So we did it again, we did a couple more drills, and we were able to get it down. So we had an automated process that could roll the keys, and we validated that a properly implemented client saw no problem. Now, if you write a client that only grabs the first item in the list or in the set, I can't help you. The other thing is the receiver of the call has to decide to actually check the token, I mean the, the signature. There's nothing that says they can't just ignore the signature and accept whatever is sent to them. So depending, like that's where if you need to like enforce something on the other side, looking at tools like mutual TLS and things like that might be a better tool for you. We're comfortable saying we as we are gonna audit you as a partner, we expect you to check this stuff, we'll trust that you do it the right way. If you are interested, there's two major libraries uh, and the spec and the memo links here. Uh, the memo is, is pretty interesting, a nice read that kind of justifies everything. Questions about HTTP signatures? Uh, I'll go there first and then. Uh, I can tell you that afterwards. Uh, we can't, it, it was more than, um, let's see, it's more than five digits a second. But <laughs> I, I can't give exact numbers. I can give you like magnitudes. Uh, uh, the keys are actually, uh, are actually defined uh, in the signature block, so it tells you what kind of key it is. So you can use RSA, DSA, you can use a whole bunch of uh, different ones. So that's all in, basically, the HTTP signatures tells you how to tell the clients what key it is and where to go look it up. So you, it, it actually is changeable. Uh, so we have two keys, different key IDs. So every, every request will have a key ID on it, and then the expectation is you look up valid keys from our like, public URL, and the idea is anytime you see a key ID you don't recognize, you go out and retrieve the entire list and cache the keys. So every, when a new one shows up, you should go out and get it. So you do incur that hit once, but you won't incur it every time. All right, now I'll talk about where we actually use all of these particular technologies. Our OAuth in drives a, all of our API interactions. So that's all of our mobile clients, things we call smart apps, which are kind of automations. So if you want to say, whenever your door opens, you want to like turn on the lights and do these four or five other things and then send it off to some deep learning a API in Google. You can implement all that with the API if you'd like. That's, but you do it all authorized with OAuth. The other one is service providers. So that's things um, where they're going to provide a service to you. Like we're gonna push a, we're gonna shut off your washer or not your washer. We're gonna push off your air conditioner whenever power demands get too high. Like you set a rating and your energy company can like, I'm gonna go turn off your, pop, your, your air conditioner to not overcharge you type of thing. So those are the type of things that service providers would integrate for. HTTP signatures we use for outbound calls to smart apps. As part of this like integration, anytime, let, let's say anytime your door opens, if you want, we can set up a callback and we'll call into you. It's either, it's not exactly a webhook, um, and it's, it, we can also in, invoke a Lambda, we can do a few things, but anything that's HTTP, we actually do a uh, HTTP signature for. So you can validate that we're the ones calling you. And in particular, 
that allows you to not have to implement auth infrastructure on your side. Because normally you would expect the person you're calling to have implemented OAuth as well, and then you do an OAuth exchange. And that's a lot of work if someone just wants to set up small automations. So we went with HTTP signatures because of that. And we use OAuth outbound <laughs> uh, whenever we do things like uh, uh, voice agents or uh, cloud devices. So things like the Arlo or Alexa, Google, all of those are things that we do this OAuth out for. So we use JWT heavily, but we use it in web sessions and we use it in token exchange at the edges of our graph. And I'll, I'll show you what that looks like. So questions about our uses before I go into like the fun bits of scaling. All right. So what makes auth hard to scale? It, it sounds like it should be easy, right? But it's inherently centralized, and there's also a har very high cardinality for everything. So you, and you can't break legacy, and that's, that's one of our big things is we can't, because our platform has been around for more than five years, we have very old clients that may have weird auth mechanisms that we can't get rid of yet, but we want to limit their impact on the rest of the system. So in particular, with tokens, you might have multiple auth systems running, or you might have multiple data stores behind the covers. You might have di lots of different backends. So one thing is you want to make sure your auth clients in your microservices and everywhere else actually understand how to interpret different tokens. So for example, we know all JWTs have periods in them. So we made sure not to have any other tokens that have periods in them. And so we can detect the periods and know, hey, that's a JWT. We're going to check it locally. So we can do the signature checks and everything. We don't have to call to an auth server in that case. And then anytime we have dashes, we know it's an opaque token. We have to call, an ex we have to call the auth system. It's going to have to go look something up in a database. The other thing, though, we can do is prefixing tokens. So this is something where um, we were really forward looking and we knew that one of these is going to be the legacy token store. So we started prefixing all of our tokens with legacy. <laughs> and the other token store is the fresh one. So we started putting everything in as fresh. Uh, let's see if we can, oh, that doesn't zoom in too much. But you can zoom in on your own. In this case, the resource server doesn't know anything about what auth server to go to, it's always just going to hit this central like auth server, and then it proxies to the different data, data systems. But if you extend your client to understand these, these prefixes that you add, you can actually have your resource server call directly to the correct token store. And that eliminates latency. So if you can get your latency in your auth server down to 10 or 15 milliseconds, to like do that hop, you're adding 10 or 15 milliseconds just to do a hop that you can move to the client side. So we always make sure we have this auth server here though, because if a client hasn't upgraded and hasn't put in that new uh, prefix potentially, we don't want that to break. So basically if we have two prefixes in our clients and we've added a third one, Anytime our, our auth client doesn't understand a prefix, it falls back to using that traditional auth server that is the centralized place that knows how to authorize and understand every token. So our auth server right now can support and understand JWT and three different backends for tokens. And depending on what prefix comes in or the format of the token, it does the different work. Now, all of that, we can move to the clients, but we have 150 microservices running. So convincing everyone to go update their auth client is actually challenging. So we do it over time, in particular when servicer, servers are like, hey, we're really like, we don't like this extra 15 milliseconds, we have to like do auth checks. And we're like, well, 90% of your tokens, according to your metrics, are JWTs. You can check all of those locally. Here's the upgrade, go ahead and do it. And then they see a nice performance gain. 
So we, that's, that's kind of the pattern that we have to do because in order to like really scale this out, we have to make sure it's very safe. Another thing we do with tokens, this one's in particular unique to us because of design decisions in our auth. Right now, we, when you make a call from the client, it's going to have this opaque token. An opaque token is a token that's like a UUID or something that needs to be looked up somewhere. You can't, there's nothing encoded in it inherently. So that comes in, and the way we work is the API edge system does not know all of the authorizations of the other microservices. So if you have, we have those very fine-grained scopes we showed earlier, but because of that, it's very hard to have one system reason about all of the different ways scopes work. So we have a device service, a location service, each reason about the scopes as, as necessary. And then we pass the opaque token in, it gets forwarded on, and all of those then have to call the auth server to do a check. And that means every hop along the way, you're incurring that cost. So what we do with JWTs is we actually exchange, when, that, when we do the check, oh, the Zoom really does not like me today. Sorry. When we, when we do the check with the opaque token, the API edge will get a new JWT and pass the JWT token along the green arrows. Yeah. Of course. The green, <laughs> the green arrows uh, basically flow out from API edge to the state service location, and then the location proxies into device service, potentially. So that's where the JWT has all of the information we need about that user. It has the scopes, and they're signed. It has... It has everything. And what's key is, since, the, since JWTs are hard to revoke, we, this is a very short-lived token. And that token just lives for the, it's intended to live for the length of this request only. So the, at the edge of the graph, we do the exchange, and then that JWT can spider out wherever. But that also means if someone accidentally logs a token out past the API edge on accident, it doesn't matter because by the time that log hits anywhere, the token's dead. And the, it being an uh, encoded token, when you debug it, you can actually go and look and see what was in it. So you can see all of the things, like all the, the scopes, what was granted, who the user was, all of those details are then encoded in that token, and you can use it without making database calls, but you can also use it for debugging purposes, which is really powerful. So operations. Uh, how do you actually run these things at scale? Um, this is where the high cardinality gets really tricky. Um, I alluded to this a little bit. The reason we put the permission bit at the front of the scope string was to short circuit. So we really want to have allowed deny lists, and we want to be able to, to basically do that really early on in the process. So when we check a token, if we know what client it's coming from, we want to be able to block that entire class of clients with one database entry and one quick check right at the beginning. And that becomes really important because you get really easy mistakes to make that at scale break everything. <laughs> um, and you, if you have allowed deny lists, what you can do is you can load all these lists in bloom filters when you're at boots, as long as they're not, assuming they're not going to be huge like, your allowed deny list should be small. If they're huge, you probably have a different problem, and you should address that. Um, you can load them in bloom filters, and then the false positive rate of a bloom filter is fine because you're, you have a data store you can go and hit. And in the case of, like, like, deny, it's okay to take that extra time to make sure they shouldn't have access. We also want to make sure all the names are human readable. Uh, and quick methods to allow us to allow or deny things based on the name uh, right away. So that's where if you have a client ID and the, everyone's talking about the U, this like really long UUID of you, this integrator, it's really hard to actually like be like, oh, we, they ha they're having an outage or they had a security breach. We need to immediately revoke that. You, you want human readable things. Because if you have to spend five minutes looking up that in the database, 
when you got a call from their CSO saying, we, we know we're hacked, you have to shut us off. Like, <laughs> you have to do something quick. So, other, some other tips uh, that I, we found really helpful. Uh, we log prefixes of tokens, not the entire opaque token. So, that's really handy because we can talk about with testers and things like that saying, hey, we know you had this prefix of a token. We're seeing that it's invalid. Is that what you thought you sent? And usually it comes back, no, I didn't send that token. It's like, okay, well, your request had that token on it. You have a bug somewhere. <laughs> but if you don't show anything about auth, it becomes very hard to actually like operate it. The other one is scope aliasing. I'm sure you saw our scopes can be a little challenging because they're very verbose. So the idea there is you may want to make a scope that's an alias such as like voice agent or mobile phone, and then you can control all of the appropriate things a mobile phone can do on a user's behalf. And you can do that in such a way that allows you to remove things that have become sensitive. Uh, in particular with voice agents, it's perfectly fine to have a voice agent lock your door. It's not okay for a voice agent that can't understand who the user is to unlock a door. Because first generations of some of these voice agents, you could stand outside and shout through the door and it would work fine. And so having them unlock something, if they don't know who the user is, is actually a problem. But some voice agents can tell who you are based on your voice now. So, Errors at scale. Uh, make sure you special case errors. Uh, it's very easy to cause cascading failures if you don't special case errors in your uh, auth server. I'll go through an actual example. Um, <laughs> basically, a data store started failing. So we returned 500 from our auth server because something's very broken. The app server's uh, auth code said, hey, I got a 500 from my auth server. That's probably a 401 because I don't trust that that wasn't a malformed if you're being very, very paranoid, it might be a malformed payload that's trying to take down the auth server. So I'm going to assume it's a 401 and treat it as such. Now the mobile client started getting 401s. That triggers a refresh flow, which then mobile clients put more pressure on the already failing data store to get new tokens and new refresh tokens. And then you go back to one in a loop until you somehow manage to either scale your data store or turn off the clients temporarily. So in particular, be very diligent about your error codes. 401 tends to mean go get a new token. 403 means don't do that again. 500s is try again, but coordinate your jitter and back off with your users. And that becomes really hard to actually coordinate if your users are third parties. So you have to be a little defensive there. What questions do you have? Uh, you, yeah. Um, when you add the open tape, uh, open token, you can get them kicked back from multiple checks. Why couldn't you do that easily? What do you mean? Ah, Why just try it, because it would act, uh, are you talking about uh, this? Uh, no. Oh. This one. Uh, yes. So it's actually what happens is the opaque token goes to the API edge. It checks it. It says, is that a valid token? It says yes. Okay. And then we forward that token and a new request onto the location service. The location service doesn't, it says, okay, is, it, is this a valid token? <laughs> and then makes the call again. So it's because we, every microservice has to read the token to understand what the scopes are to implement authentication. Not, so, sorry, to, to implement authorization, the auth Z, the whether or not you're allowed to do something, because each service can interpret the scope. Why can't I just check password? That's what we ended up doing with JWT. So the other thing is whether or not you trust your network. So do you trust, your, if you trust your network, you can say, once you get past the edge, we're not going to do security checks and just say, here's the full context of every request. That, for the way this particular constellation is built, doesn't work for us. So we do a check on every, on every hop to make sure 
Because if you were doing mutual TLS or something between your two services, then you, you would be much, like, you would feel much better about that. <laughs> Uh, so when we first implemented this, that was a problem. Uh, it ended up not being a problem in practice once we got to JWTs. So doing the JWT swap allows us to say, the start of this request, this JWT is going to last so long, and if it takes longer than that period, we're going to stop it anyway. So how long are you uh, an access token is a day right now for most things. And then a JWT token is like two minutes, so, or less in some cases. So you shouldn't have latency of two minutes. Yeah, and, and basically it's only that long to deal with the fact that NTP isn't perfect. Like, we know we have clock drift up to a certain extent, and we know there's lag. So we wanted to make sure we never had the argument about why NTP was bad. Yeah. <laughs> Other questions? Wait, uh, we're hiring. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks.